morning, Grace. My name is Amy Vanderberg, and I will be reading from 1 John 3. I'll start at verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are the truth and reassure our heart before him. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure, reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Thank you, Amy. Would you all pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the men, the women, and the children that are in this room. Father, we ask that at this time, as we get into the word, that your truths would become evident, that I would speak with clarity, conciseness, and in a way that brings glory to you through your word. So, Father, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We ask and we pray all of this in his beautiful name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, my name is Ryan Atkins, for those of you that I have not met. Um, I serve in the Timothy position here, which is essentially a pastor in training, and so uh, this is part of my training. While Pastor Steve is on sabbatical for these few weeks, um, I have the opportunity now to fill the pulpit and to garner some experience up here, and so I thank you all for your willingness to um, allow that to happen um, and your willingness to support that happening. And so just a quick reminder of the, the overarching uh, theme and big idea for this letter. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, let's turn it on. That helps. There we go. We find joy as we abide in God, who is both light and love. So that's our overarching theme. And so uh, up to this point, we've been talking about how God is light. And now we're going to transition more into the God is love aspect of John's letter. And so, remember that John's writing into a historical context. He, he's writing uh, in a such a way that it, it begs the question, why would he be defining God in this way? Why would he be asking, why would he be defining God for, as light and as love? And so, if you think about some of the kind of the uh, dichotomies that he's presented so far in the letter, <clears throat> they, they provide implications for his and will be, and, and what we get to experience and the way we should act because of love. And so 
the, the world's view is constantly changing, right? They're always trying to uh, accommodate and, and whatnot. But really, biblically, love is pretty constant. It's well-defined, and it gives us, it provides implications for how we are to live and what that love should look like. And so today's big idea in our passage is that as we abide in God's love, we will love others in the way that Jesus Christ loved first. And so John starts this passage by presenting this love and hate, this, this difference between children of God and, and children of the devil. And, and we've known our directive from the beginning, right? He tells us this, that we are to love one another. And John is circling back to one of his main exhortations in the letter that he provided earlier, which was love for one another. But it's not, it's not a new exhortation. We're all familiar, I believe, with Jesus' command in John 13. I referenced it two weeks ago, if you were here, that a new, Jesus says, a new commandment I have given to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And catch that, just as I have loved you, Jesus provides the utmost example of what love looks like. And it's a love the likes of which the world had never seen and, and it has not seen if we aren't not in Jesus Christ. And so we'll come back to this passage again in a few minutes, but listen to Paul's words in, in Romans 13. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And Paul is citing a portion of the Mosaic law of the Ten Commandments as he's writing this to these, these Christians in Rome. But really he's pointing even further back to Leviticus 19. Listen to these words from Leviticus 19. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely. And so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall feel your, fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And this passage from Leviticus mirrors our passage today. Moses started with a, a deed and an action to benefit the poor and the sojourner, but then concluded with directives regarding hate and love. John's passage today starts with the discussion of, of hate and love and then moves to its implications. And so John cites this murder, this Cain's murdering of Abel, to further his explanation of, of the separation between children of God and children of the devil. That <clears throat> in Genesis 4, Cain murders Abel. It's a, it's a tale that most of us, I think, if we've been to Sunday school, are familiar with. If you've started a Bible reading plan, I would venture to say that most of you have made it through Genesis 4. And so I just try and recall here, right? Even though Cain and Abel were brothers, they were not of the same character. And remember, John is writing to oppose the teachings in this context of some who would identify as brothers in the church, but have gone astray. And so it is apparent to those who are not walking in the light that were trying to justify and rationalize their beliefs and practices. And ultimately, John's use of Cain is to show us that 
hate and murder are the uh, antithesis of love and care for one another. Listen, listen to Jesus' words as he lays out the great commandment. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And another, another parable that most of us, I would believe, are familiar with is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, him being Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, the lawyer, answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, he being Jesus, to the lawyer, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Just a quick aside. Don't try to just, justify yourself to Jesus, right? Just hear his words. Jesus replies, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring, an oil, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. This parable shows what love for another looks like. And we're going to come back to this parable in a minute because it has bigger implications for us. But what I want us to see is in, in John's laying out of the Cain story, he's showing that jealousy and hatred and murder is a terrible sequence. One commentator wrote it this way, that murder is the ultimate act of hate and demonstrates the absence of love in the most extreme way. And John's vocabulary, as his, in his reference to Cain, is very telling as well. He identifies Cain as of the evil one. He was determined, aggressive, and fervently and actively opposed to what is good based on that use of the word evil. And the use of the word murdered, that term that he used there, was a vivid term that meant to slaughter, to butcher, to kill by violence. And often it was used in regards to an animal sacrifice. And so it's also the same word used multiple times in Revelation in conjunction with the lamb who was slain in reference to Jesus. So that slain being the same. But note how John identifies that Cain was of the evil one. But also that his deeds, were not only was he of the evil one, but his deeds were evil. His nature spilled out in his actions. Jealousy served as that catalyst to take his hatred and to murder. And so how does John connect these truths of what happened between Cain, is, Cain and Abel to his readers? He says, do not be surprised that the world hates you. If Cain would hate his own brother to the point of murder, why would we expect anything different from the world? John is showing that the same passions that fueled Cain's jealousy and hatred are both in, in his context and today in ours now fueling those that are opposed to Christians. Satan was at work in the garden with Eve's children, and he continues that work today. And remember that Jesus said it would be so. In John 15, Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I cho chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And in Luke 21, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. It's very clear. If our lives reflect the testimony of Jesus Christ, we will look differently than the world around us. We should. 
those who are of the world will eventually resent us because we are exposing their false beliefs and ultimately their evil practices. We will shine the light of truth, this light that we've been talking about, this light on the various false gospels and religions of the world, essentially telling others that what they're doing isn't good enough, that there is nothing we can do that's good enough, and it, that it won't get them ultimately what they desire. And when we tell someone these things, they often don't respond well, right? I don't like being told I'm wrong. Maybe you do, but I do not. It's never a comfortable situ situation or conversation to have with someone as you're explaining to them that what they're doing and what, and what they've done isn't sufficient. But it's a necessary conversation when it comes to our religion, when it comes to Christianity, Christianity to spirituality and to life, right? If we don't understand our depravity, we don't understand the need for the gospel. We don't understand the implications of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. And so, then how do we know where we stand? Are we in life or are we in death? Our love is the characteristic that identifies where we are. If we're walking in the light and abiding in Christ, the love of Christ will overflow to those around us. Just as jealous and hate, jealousy and hatred overflowed from Cain into murder, so too our love and the love of Christ will flow through us to action. We become this conduit, a channel that allows that love of Christ to flow through us and to others. The love of Christ provides life, preventing hatred and death, and that love is the surest test of having life, eternal life that is evidenced in our particular love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our decision to follow Christ, to accept the gospel, this is the moment, that is the moment that we pass from darkness and death into the light and life. Right? It's not only our future, it's now. And if you listen to Jesus' words in John 5, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And eternal life is a relationship with God that begins in this life. And if we are in life, we cannot harbor hate. See John's words. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. John equates hate with murder. The attitudes of each are the same. The difference lies in the action. The actual deed of murder is what separates in God's eyes the two. Morally, they're equivalent. And so for those of us who are in Christ, this attitude should not be said of us. Our lives should be defined by love, righteous, godly love, not by hate. But what is this love? It's not as the world defines it. Christ is the ultimate and supreme example of love. And we see this in John's passage that the Christian knows love by the example that Jesus Christ has set for us. As John presented Cain as the supreme example of hate, Christ is now presented as the supreme example of love and that Christ is the model for us to emulate. And an essence of this love is self-sacrifice, that Christ laid down his life. And I would encourage you this week to read through Romans 5 and just to see the implications of how and when. But Paul's words there are beautiful. And John says that, that th this essence of love is self-sacrifice and that the implication of that is that we too ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And, and elsewhere in the Greek, this phrase, lay down life, is used to refer to taking a risk for another, from hazarding one's life for another, but it's not necessarily to the point of sacrificial death. And it's with this in mind that John then transitions to direct application of the principle, right? Laying down one's life leads us to exhibiting a proper expression of love for others, meeting the needs of others for the basic necessities of life. And not many of us will be called to lay down 
our lives in a heroic deed of some sort, actually giving our lives. But we regularly have the opportunity to meet physical needs of those around us through the sharing of our possessions. Note the change in, in 1 John in 3, in verse 16. 16 to 17, he goes from this plural to the singular. Listen, by this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? There's significance in this change. An author and commentator, G.P. Lewis, wrote, It's easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. Loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. Loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. So think back to that parable of the Good Samaritan. That parable, that, that lawyer is looking to understand what, who is my neighbor, looking to justify himself. And that parable clearly defines neighbor. The lawyer's question implies that there is a non-neighbor, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor, right? And the parable says that this is not so. Everyone on the road that day was a neighbor to the Samaritan, was a neighbor to the man who was injured. We can't predetermine who our neighbors are. The course of our lives will determine that for us. We must keep our eyes up and looking out to see our neighbors. And once you identify your neighbor, once you see them, the, the parable then provides insight as to what we are to do. Right? The parable also defines what love for others looks like. What was the Samaritan's focus? He was led to, to save the life of another, seeing him, the injured individual, having compassion on him, and moving to the aid and service of this individual. He didn't ask what's in it for me or say, well, whoever can hurt him, they could still be lurking around. They might be hurt, they're waiting to hurt me, right? He didn't, he didn't look at the situation that way. He didn't take time to analyze what the implications would be, what it might cost, or, or, or etc. He, he moved to help the victim. He took him to the inn and committed to pay the cost for his care. As the Samaritan moved to action, we too are to be moved to action, to love in deed and in truth, as John says. Love that fails to take action for the good of others is mere religious rhetoric. Our deeds are a sign of our love, and they are married to truth. John is connecting these deeds to the gospel message, right? In deed and in truth. That we all are in a state of depravity without Christ. That God, the Holy One, that man essentially spit in God's face, said, we, we don't need you, we, we're going to be like you. And that through time, that cycle repeated itself over and over. And then Jesus comes in life, death, and resurrection, and that all that we can do is in response to, to Jesus' life. That there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation but it's only in response to what Christ has done. Right? We love because he first loved us. We have these sayings around here that you, know, you matter to us because you matter to God. Yes. And that we believe there is no greater joy, N-O, greater joy, than to know, K-N-O-W, greater joy. And that joy is only found through a personal relationship of faith and obedience to Jesus Christ. He is the source of true joy. These acts, these deeds, are consistent with the gospel as a reflection of the love we have experienced through Christ. Christ's death is a genuine offering and a model of self-sacrifice that should inspire us to higher levels of giving. 
It should extend our boundaries, and it should extend our reach. John is encouraging his readers to perform visible acts of love, acts as a result of Christ's saving activity, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Acts not because, or not, not in order to earn salvation, but because of salvation. And so this morning, as you can see, we're going to be taking communion. And so I'm going to ask Bob to come forward uh, to play some piano for us. And if I could have the deacons that are going to be serving this morning come forward at this time. Just hold on to the elements we'll take together at the end. Uh, um, I'll lead us through that. that you'd be reflecting upon what it is that Christ has done and accomplished for each and every one of us at this time.
Before Jesus went to the cross on the night that he was betrayed, he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. And Matthew's account of the Lord's Supper says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So at this time, let's do this in remembrance of Christ. Take and eat, take and drink. So in light of Christ's perfect example of love, we find assurance in Jesus Christ for those of us who are in Christ. And so as we finish our passage this morning, these last six verses, John has given us this tall order, right, so far in our passage today, this exhortation that could potentially give us guilt or doubt in our hearts and our minds. But believers, brothers, sisters, we can have confidence when we stand before God based on the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross and not on our works. I don't know about you all, but oftentimes there's this inner voice that likes to, to cast doubt, to hinder my feelings of adequacy, Don't let your inner voice rob you of the joy that comes with knowing the truth of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ. We have confidence in the truth of the gospel and the God that is the actor of that truth. As one commentator put it, our assurance is anchored in God and God alone, never in our own ability to generate any feelings of confidence. The author to the Hebrews wrote, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through that curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Our doubts will diminish, and that inner voice quieted when we are walking in faithfulness and obedience with our fellow brothers and sisters, followers of Christ. As we abide in him, that inner voice shifts from self-condemnation to to praise of God's faithfulness to us. When we have God's opinion of us through Jesus Christ in the forefront of our minds, do we see ourselves, do we see our spouses, our children, our neighbors, as God sees us and sees them? Do we see their flaws? Or do we see them perfected in Christ Jesus? This gives us confidence and boldness in our relationship with him and with each other. Our will becomes more and more aligned with his will as we abide. Our lives become more spiritually mature, and our desires and our prayers will be like his. How does this all happen? We believe in the name of Jesus Christ and love one another as he commanded. Faith in Jesus leads to obedience to God. 
John connects these two ideas here. Note he writes commandment, not commandments. He connects faith in Christ and love for one another in this passage. The love we experience and share with others leads to a heartfelt obedience, not a false external religion, not a false external legalism. What is pleasing in God's sight should motivate us what we do, should motivate what we do as Christians. Every day we should seek to align our will with his will. And it's only through the power and work of the Holy Spirit that a person can love God through faith in Christ and love others rightly and align our lives with him. The Holy Spirit dwells within us and transforms our hearts from within as we continue to, in obedience and as we abide. This is the first explicit mention here, this last verse of our passage today, the first explicit mention of the third person of the Trinity. But the Holy Spirit is very prevalent throughout John's gospel. Listen to these words from John 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Isn't that reassuring? To know that God, through Jesus Christ, and through the work of the Holy Spirit is with us in this moment and every moment. Pretty amazing. So with all of that being said, where does that take us as, as our 24-7 worshipers? Marvel at the love that God has shown us through Jesus Christ. You want to talk about an awe moment? That's an awe moment. Are we in awe? Do we marvel at that? Or is it just another passing by thought or you know, thought passing through in a busy day? And I want to encourage you, read Romans 5 this week. Again, read it with the mindset of an awe moment. It's incredible. And as alongsiders, stir up one another to love and good works in light of the Hebrews 10 passage. Stir each other up. And as go people, who is your neighbor? Everyone along your path. Do you see your neighbors as God sees them? Do you see your, that your neighbors are made in the image of God, as we all are? Let that be your focus as you reach out to your neighbor, neighbors and extend the gospel to those who don't know it. Have courage to know that the Spirit is with you and working through you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. The love that you have displayed through Jesus Christ. The example that he has provided us as mere humans. Father, help us to abide and remain in the word and in your Son. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would work through us, would transform us, would give us a confidence and an assurance that we would feel tangibly, that we would know that we are your children, brothers and sisters, co-heirs with Christ. Father, we ask that you would quiet that inner voice that robs us that speaks self-condemnation to our hearts. And that, Father, that your voice would become through loud and clear in our minds. That the saving work, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ would be forefront of our minds every day, every moment, and in every conversation. Father, help us to reach our neighbors. Give us boldness and courage. Father, we love you. We thank you, and we pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name.